Morning, church. We're starting a series on prayer real quick. Quick test, scale of one to 10. How's your prayer life? One is not doing great. 10 is doing amazing. All right, now we're going to grade each other. Ready? I'm just kidding. We aren't going to do that. I was like, oh man, I, I've never lied to church before, but there's a first for everything. <laughs> Here's the thing about prayer, right? It always feels like you could do better than whatever you're doing. It wouldn't matter how much you prayed or how often you prayed or what you were doing. You would always feel like, but if I just had another 20 minutes, if I just had another hour, if I just, you know, if I didn't have these kids, if I didn't have this job, if I did right? If I just, if I just, if I just. So we want to take away all guilt. We want to take away all that baggage and burden and ways to feel like you're not doing enough, you're not measuring up. And we just want to give you a very simple path over the next three weeks. And so would you just, you know, you could do anything for three weeks, right? Three weeks, three weeks. What would your life look like if for the next three weeks you committed to doing the stuff we're talking about today? So let's open our Bibles, if you will, if you got one, Luke 11, chapter 11, verse one. It starts like this. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. Where is that place? Oh, it's a certain one. We can't tell you. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So, John being referred to here as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Um, and some of Jesus' disciples were disciples of John previously. And so because of that, they probably walked with John and were taught by him. And this could be Peter speaking. He likes to speak. And, um, and, and maybe just, you know, and as John's disciples jumped over to Jesus when he said, he must increase, I must decrease. Now they're like, well, John taught us to pray. And if you remember, this dawned on me. I've never noticed this till last year. So we're all learning and growing, Right. Throughout the last few chapters, Jesus be praying and the disciples are standing right there. So apparently they're listening into Jesus' prayers and like, man, how do I pray like that? And so Jesus takes all those minutes and hours of prayer and he boils it down into a phrase that many of us have heard called the Our Father. Well, maybe if you were a Catholic, that's what you called it. You just know those were the first couple words. So here's what it sounds like in Luke. There are four gospel books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're in this book here, Luke, the third one. And um, when it's in these other gospel books, it doesn't sound the exact same. So that tells us there is principles here, there's formulas here, but the words themselves aren't magical. And so we're going to get to that. But I'm going to have you read this with me, right? He said to them, and we're all going to read this together so that we're all saying the same words. Because if I had you do it on a memory, we'd have some weird amalgamation of like King James, NIV, ESV, and whatever you can remember made up your grandmother told you version. And so here we are together. Ready? Here we go. Ready? When you pray, say... Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Waiting for that. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. You're waiting for more, weren't you? Yeah, like deliver us from evil. And then the Protestants of the room go, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And the Catholics go, what is that? <laughs> and where that's coming from is out of the book of Matthew. Some of our later translations of the book of Matthew add that in there. And some of our earliest translations don't add that in there. So Catholics who've prayed the Our Father their whole life, they never had it. Protestants went, yeah, we're going to one-up you. No, I'm just kidding. It's not how it went at all. 
But we aren't exactly sure if that little extra was in the original prayer or not. It doesn't appear here in Luke's version. Did that feel weird to pray that out loud here with everybody? I hope not. Because we're going to challenge you to do that. (laughs) The early church prayed the Our Father three times a day, morning, noon, and night. In fact, I heard one scholar say to Mackey um, that they did this for hundreds of years. It's almost guaranteed that this is what Peter was doing in the book of Acts. If you know the story, not don't worry about it. When he goes up on the rooftop to pray at around the lunch hour, and all of a sudden he sees this sheet coming down out of heaven filled with unclean animals, and this is where God challenges Peter that it's okay to take the good news to the Gentiles, and he ends up at Cornelius' house. It was almost guaranteed he was praying this prayer. So when I learned that a few years ago, it was around the COVID time, I decided to take up this challenge, and I started praying this prayer three times a day, every day. And what you'll find is it gets pretty monotonous pretty quickly. And that's because, and this is where I think we want to go over the next few weeks, not think, this is where we want to go over the next few weeks, is because Jesus intended us to take the principle in this and then expand upon it. So what we're going to do is for the next three Sundays, myself, then Lyndon, our care pastor here, he'll speak next week, and then I'll come back in the third week, and we will walk through different parts of this prayer for three weeks, and we'll challenge you to expand on it. Now, what that might look like is, on that second part, let's just take one example. Linda, don't cover this next week, but give us today our daily bread. You know, that is a really important prayer if you are uh, poor and you aren't sure where your next meal is gonna come from. And what you're asking for is, God, would you feed me today? But it's bigger than that, right? It, it fits whatever need you have in front of you today. God, would you... I need a car, I can't get to work, I can't get to work, I can't have a job. God, I've got this bill and I can't afford to pay it. Would you bring the resources that I need? God, there's profound brokenness between my mom and I, my son and I. Would you help? Your daily bread would apply to any need you have in the world and you're asking God to intercede for you. Does that make sense? So, my part today I want to cover this first part. Oh, oh, I forgot this. I should probably not forget things. It'd be important. Okay. So for the next three weeks, we're going to challenge you to pray this prayer three times a day, every day for three weeks. Here's the times we're setting aside. 7, 12, and 7. 7, 12, and 7. 7 a.m., noon, 7 p.m. In fact, I know for a fact at some point in this message, my alarm is going to go off on my phone, which I just happen to have in my pocket, and I didn't turn it off. And when it goes off, I'll stop preaching and I'll turn it off. I'm telling everybody now, it's a good reminder. It's a good illustration because I don't want to just turn it off and forget. So as a part of that, I realize some of you are like, I can't do 7 a.m. That's when I take my kids to whatever. That's when I blah, blah, blah with my boss or whatever, whatever it might be. I get it. So adjust. So do 6 and noon and 7 or whatever you have to do, 8 and noon and 7. Try to hit those markers. Imagine, imagine, you know, 1,500 people, 1,800 people, those of us who watch online too, all doing this at the same time for three weeks. Then we're gonna do is we're gonna do some little extras, and you can find that. Here's the prayer on the front, in case you weren't sure where to find it in the scriptures. And then on the back of this card, which you can find at our Connect tab as you're walking out the door, on the back is like a schedule. So every Monday and Tuesday for three weeks, at 7 a.m., we're gonna gather, do a little prayer, a little devotion, and, and a little worship together. If you wanna come and join us in our venue down there where the kids meet, you're welcome to come and join us at 7 a.m., Monday and Tuesday for the next three weeks. I'll be leading us the next two, and then I wanna hand it off to some other staff, I hope, so that they could do the same thing. And then every Wednesday and Friday, we'll gather online. Same thing, a little prayer, a little devotion time online. You can engage with us and, and watch and pray along with us at noon on Wednesday and Friday. So Monday, Tuesday, 7 a.m., Wednesday, Friday is at noon, and then we're gonna do a Sunday or a Thursday evening at 7. Thursday evening at 7 p.m., gather, just a little worship, a little prayer. Feel free to come, bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring anybody you would like, and uh, we'll pray and seek the Lord together. So, okay, there you go. Pick up this card or open your app, download the Kingsway app. We put a ton of information in there. This announcement is brought to you Bye. Okay, now let's get back into the message. Let's unpack the very first two things I want to cover with you today that I hope impact your prayers. You're praying this prayer. The first one is this Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Father, Father. What is your relationship with your earthly dad like? As a dad myself, who has three little boys, I am constantly aware of how I am failing as a dad. 
It's always in front of me. And part of it is because I see the perfection of the Heavenly Father and I realize all the ways that I don't match up. But it didn't take long for me to realize that almost guaranteed that the way I relate with my kids will be the way that they relate with their Heavenly Father. And I hope that men, when you hear that, that stings a little bit and that sting moves you into action instead of wallowing in pity or whatever. Wives, this would be a good time to keep your elbows to yourselves. <laughs> but I want you to think for a moment about your own relationship with your earthly dad. What was it like? Were they too busy with their job to have time for you? If so, do you ever struggle to believe that God is too busy to have time for you? Were they angry when there was a problem? Did they yell or scream or threaten or hit? Do you often think of God as angry when you sin? Not angry at the sin, like angry at you. Was your dad um, effervescent with praise but light on discipline? So you tend to think of God as all grace and no truth. To see how this could play out in everyday life. I love the way Brennan Manning says this in his book, The Furious Longing of God. He says this, our father, familiar words, maybe so familiar that they are no longer real. Those words were not only real, but also revolutionary to the 12 disciples. Pagan philosophers such as Aristotle arrived at the existence of God via human reason and referred to him in vague, impersonal terms. The uncaused cause, they called him, or the immovable mover. The prophets of Israel revealed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a warmer, more compassionate manner. But only Jesus revealed to an astonished Jewish community that God is truly Father. I remember my wife, when we had our, our little boys, she would um, lament that the first words out of their mouth weren't mama. They were dada. And I mean, can you blame them? I'm joking, honey. I love you. I'm joking. I mean, she's the one literally who, who made this happen and, and fed them and cared for them and nurtured them and did all the things for them and the first words out of their mouth. And everybody who studies this knows it's not because they like dad better. And it's not because dad's better at connecting with them. It's because those consonants roll off the tongue. Well, if you were to go to the Middle East today and you were to see little babies, especially in, in um, Israel, the first letters rolling off their tongue were ab, 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 which is not surprising because when Jesus addresses his father in heaven personally or intimately, he calls him Abba. Not like the 70s musical band, although I've always wondered, like, where did they get that? Some of you are like, the what? I know. Abba. Abba. Abba in Aramaic is as close to daddy as we could possibly get in our language today. I had this friend of Bible college. Um, we called her Gabby. Gabrielle or Gabriella, I can't remember, was her full name. And um, we would travel around. This is how I met my wife. We were on a camp team together and we'd go to churches and church camps and we'd speak and teach and lead worship and all the kind of things. And Gabby was on our team. And um, occasionally, you know, we'd get together as a group and we'd pray with teenagers or other leaders or whatever. And, you know, sometimes they'd ask me to pray or, or Rachel or somebody else to pray. And a lot of times it was Gabby's turn to pray. You know, if you're going around the circle, you know, Gabby, we'd all be holding hands or whatever. We'd be sitting there and, and Gabby would always do these long pauses. You know, Gabby, she was a little bit hippie, right? And she'd do these long pauses, these dramatic moments. She was really good at, at that kind of thing. And I'd always be thinking, all right, come on, we're all waiting for you. It's your turn. Did you forget it's your turn? Maybe I need to jump in and rescue her, right? And, and so we're sitting there in awkward silence. And she'd breathe. And then she'd go, Daddy. And my skin would just like curl like, ah, you were talking to the God of the universe. He is not Daddy. He is Heavenly Father, what are you doing? He is holy and righteous and powerful. He made, he literally spoke in like nebula and stars burst into the sea. And like, what are you doing? And then I started studying this and I went, oh, Gabby was onto something that I wasn't yet. 
You know, Jesus is teaching his disciples one day and he says, um, do not call anybody on earth father because you have only one father and he's in heaven. I don't think it's a sin if your kids call you father. That's not what Jesus is saying. But I do think Jesus is trying to draw this understanding in us. Like there's God, he's father, and then there's your dad and he's different. Because no matter how hard the best dad in the room tries, you will never perfectly be father. And so you're always gonna be leaving a gap between him and you for them to see. But that doesn't mean you don't try. And that doesn't mean you don't step into it. But what it does mean is for all of us, and that's why the rest of the prayer about God forgive us as I forgive others is so important because as I'm forgiving my dad, as I'm releasing whatever pain might be there for many of you, I'm also accepting the love of my heavenly father. I've used this story, I think at least a couple times, and I'm gonna be honest, as long as I'm the pastor Kingsway, it's probably gonna come up every once in a while. So if that bothers you, I'm just gonna ask for your forgiveness now and I'm already over it. So anyway, <laughs> in his book, The Furious Longing of God, Brennan tells the story that shook quite a few people last service. He says this, I will never forget a retreat experience years ago in the Midwest. It was a rather large gathering, about 7,000 people. An invitation for healing prayer followed each night's service. I would go into a side room and meet with those who felt compelled to come. On one particular night, the line extended well beyond midnight, and after finishing, I went straight to bed. Not even taking my clothes off, I was so exhausted. About three o'clock in the morning, I heard a rap on the door and a squeaky little voice. Brennan, can I talk to you? I opened the door to find a 78-year-old nun. As she began to cry, sister, what can I do for you? We found two chairs in the hallway, and her story began. I've never told anyone this in my entire life. It started when I was five years old. Because I know that we have kids listening, I'm gonna leave out a couple lines where she goes on to describe the abuse and molestation that her dad did to her. She says, by the time I was 12, I knew of every kind of sexual perversion you read about in dirty books. Brennan, do you have any idea how dirty I feel? I've lived with so much hatred of my father and hatred of myself that I would only go to communion when my absence would be conspicuous. In the next few minutes, I prayed with her for healing. Then I asked her if she would find a quiet place every morning for the next 30 days, sit down in a chair, close her eyes, upturn her palms, and pray this one phrase over and over. Ready? Abba, I belong to you. It's a prayer of exactly seven syllables, the number that corresponds perfectly to the rhythm of our breathing. <clears throat> as you inhale, Abba. As you exhale, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Through her tears, she agreed, yes, Brennan, I will. One of the most moving and poetic follow-up letters I've ever received came from this sister. In it, she described the inner healing of her heart, a complete forgiveness of her father, and an inner peace she'd never known in 78 years. She concluded her letter with these words. A year ago, I would have signed this letter with my real name in religious life, Sister Mary Genevieve. But from now on, I'm daddy's little girl. Be aware, this is not sloppy sentimentality or indulgent wishful thinking, but rather a woman who dared to pray in the childlike trust and deep reverence that Jesus said would mark a disciple. And in, so, in doing so, discovered the fur furious love of her Abba. The greatest gift I've ever received in my life 
is the Abba experience. I can only stutter and stammer about the life-changing power of the Abba encounter. My name is Brennan Manning, and I'm daddy's little boy. I don't know what your relationship with your earthly dad is like. I do know that we're gonna have to talk about this at the men's retreat further, and there is a growing epidemic of bad dads. Satan is winning a battle. But no matter how good or how bad your earthly dad was, he's not your heavenly father. And even the best dads in the room are a broken reflection of the perfect thing. But the real thing is so much better, so much better. Recently, I was listening to a sermon by a guy named Francis Chan. I don't know if you guys know Francis. If you don't know Francis, just go to YouTube and anything you find with Francis' name on it, that's Francis, not somebody else, feel free to watch it, you'll be good. I was watching a sermon the other day by Francis and Francis does what Francis does. He was just sharing out of his own life and experience and he was talking about God in terms that I sat there watching and I said to myself and I said out loud, I want what he has. There was no jealousy, I'm not envious of him, but he speaks of God in a way that I think there's more for me than I'm currently experiencing. There's more available to me than I'm currently walking in and I wanna know it, I wanna know it. I want to walk with my father in such a way that I, I'm, I, I just, we're one and the same. And I want that for you too. And if I had more time, I'd keep going on this father thing. But I think I've got to balance the father thing with the rest of it. So coming back to verse two, it says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed. How many of you say hallowed in your everyday life? <laughs> right? I think if you put it in word, it'd probably autocorrect or something. Hallowed or hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. This is the beauty of this. The word hallowed in the Greek is literally, and I'm probably going to botch this, hagiastito. Hagiastito literally just means holy. Holy is your name. God's holiness means that God does not see the world, our sin, and our problems the way we do. God's holiness. The word holy literally means different or set apart. And the reason that's powerful is the same God who, again, spoke nebula and galaxies and planets and stars into being and created hundreds of thousands, whatever the number is, of beetles, and he's created bugs and humans and trees and life and the complexities of all the things that science has discovered and even the things they cannot yet figure out. He created all of it just from a word from his mouth. I'm just like, there it is. That God who's that powerful, that otherly, that God who we are told no one has ever seen except for Jesus Christ, who's made him known. He's literally unknowable and he's father and he's intimate and he's right here, but he's literally all powerful. He's holy. He's different. He doesn't think about. He's got all the resources, all the access, all the ability you need right here, right now, all of it in an itty little living space. He has literally everything you need for life and godliness. That's what it means that he's hallowed. One of my favorite passages, it doesn't actually say the word holy in it, but I love this passage. In Isaiah chapter 55, God is rebuking Israel. He's been warning them for years um, to turn to him. So this, ah, this is so deep. I don't know if I can make sense of this. But throughout the, the prophet Isaiah's ministry, in the very beginning, Isaiah chapter 6, God tells Isaiah, I'm going to send you to these people, but they're hard-hearted and they won't listen. They won't respond. But you're going to go anyway. Good luck. Have fun with your ministry. It's not going to be fruitful in that sense, but I need you to go do what I'm asking you to do. And see, what God is doing is he's telling Isaiah to warn the people to listen to God so that he doesn't have to discipline them. But he's also telling Isaiah that most of them aren't going to listen to you and I'm going to have to discipline them anyway. And so the whole book of Isaiah is kind of building up to this moment. When we get to around this section in the mid-50s, it's God letting the Israelites know what his judgment is for their not listening to him. But in the middle of that, he also tells them how he's going to forgive them and restore them and renew them. And he ultimately points them to Jesus. And in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, he says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my way, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Go read Isaiah 55, go into 56 sometime. You'll see God is talking about both his discipline and his forgiveness. 
He's going to forgive them. He's going to restore them. He's going to renew them. He's going to put a new heart in them. In fact, go back to Isaiah 53. This is where we learn about Jesus, the suffering servant, and all that he would go through. And Jesus tells us to pray to God in this way, holding that tension of father and that tension of holy. It's God's not either or. He's both and all the time. He's full on grace and he's full on truth. He's tough and he's tender. He's intimate and he's infinite. He's attentive and he's awesome. He is all these things at the same time. Yes. And that is exactly what you want him to be. You don't need some small, weak, mamby-pamby God who thinks about your problems the way you do, who can solve your problems through your power, power, your energy, and your resources. You don't need that. You need the access, the power, the resources, the infiniteness of God who understands the world in a very different way than you. But then he calls you to be like him in that world. Did you know that in 1 Peter, Peter says, so be holy because your heavenly father is holy. Some translations say, be holy as your heavenly father is holy. So in other words, what God is longing for is for you to start to see the world the way he sees the world. There's a formula in this world that makes sense. And it depends on your situation, how you might apply it, right? But the formula goes something like this. I've worked hard, so I deserve this, so I'm going to take it. Or, is that mine? Hang on. It's time to pray. I'm going to turn off the next two. I've got one at 11.50, 11.55, and then noon. Like, hey, idiot, don't forget. So in 10 minutes, we're going to pray. No matter where I am in the sermon, we're going to pray. All right. So there's this formula, right? And the formula might look like this. I deserve to be happy. I've given myself. Therefore, I'm going to take. I've got to feed my family. It doesn't matter how this impacts anybody else. I'm going to look out for number one. There's a lot of different ways you can apply this formula, but because this way that our flesh naturally sees the world, and God is holy, he's not like us, and he's calling us to see our world differently. So when other people hurt us, he's calling us to look at them as sinners who need a savior instead of looking at them as people who need us to extract justice on them. Vengeance is mine to repay, says the Lord. And so there's this call in this prayer from Jesus to both come into the presence of Father and say, God, I need you, while at the same time holding the tension of forgive me as I forgive others. Like the expectation is I'm forgiving others. Which is why in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says this shortly after that, he says, to the degree to which you forgive others, God will forgive you. Can forgiveness be contingent with God? I mean, I don't know what to do with that. You go wrestle with Jesus. His whole point is, if God has forgiven you, the expectation is it's a fountain that flows out of you, forgiveness. And I get it. This isn't a sermon on what do we do about justice because I don't believe forgiveness and justice are separate. Or what do we do about trust? I'm not saying that. It's just that when I'm struggling to forgive someone who has hurt me, what I do is I come to my knees and I say, our Father in heaven, Holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Do you see how it works? I'm bringing it right to the place where I find both the intimacy of a father who says, what they did to you is evil and wrong and I'll take care of it. And also the power to say, God, help me because I want to go get them. I want to take care of mine. If we go on Luke chapter 11, verse five, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. That's pretty late, right? And you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Now, the way this would work in Jewish culture is um, if somebody came to your house and, and you didn't even know they were coming, right? It's not like you pick up the phone and be like, hey, I'm an hour out. I'll be there in a little bit, right? It's like they're obviously showing up at midnight, which means that it was maybe unexpected or unplanned. They didn't know. They got in late. 
there's not a store to go to. This is not modern day America, right? We can go to somebody, Walgreens or something that's open 24 hours a day and find your basic necessities. So they show up at your house. You're expected, because they're getting in late after a long day of travel, a long day of travel, you're expected to meet their needs and serve them. And they show up and you got nothing. And they're hungry and they're famished and they're counting on you. So you go to your neighbor and you knock on the door and you say, I need three loaves of bread and I need it right now. And your neighbor responds. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Jesus goes on verse eight. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. I just said last service, I hadn't planned on it, wasn't in my notes, but maybe that ought to be your next tattoo. Just right here on the arm. Matt Nickerson, shameless audacity. Don't put the Matt Nickerson. You replace that, because that'd just be weird, right? Don't, you don't need to do that. Shameless audacity. Jesus is encouraging us to have shameless audacity with our Father. And he's saying, this neighbor of yours, who, not even because of friendship, like he does not care, but he'll get out of bed and help you because you won't stop knocking on his door. How much more so your father who loves you? Because as a good father, God delights in meeting all your needs. He delights in it. And to hammer home the point, Jesus goes even further. He says in verse nine, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. I did a funeral uh, this past week. It's a terrible, painful, tragic story. But there were a number of people there at that funeral that, um, I don't know, maybe some of you are here today or, or watching online. And I just want to say this. So f- for the rest of the Kingsway people, just give me a second here. You will find Jesus if you look for him. When you look for him with all of your heart, you will find him. He will not be hard to find when you look for him. He was behind the couch the whole time. It was amazing. Um, But you have to look for him. You have to seek. You have to ask. In the book of James, we're told, you do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask, you have bad motives. You just want to get more for yourself. God can't honor that prayer because that's not a holy prayer. So he can't answer that. But when you seek, if you seek for him and after his kingdom, that's the kind of prayer that honors him. You will find him. In fact, he goes on, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, you're gonna give him a scorpion. Now the answer is some of you would do that. But you shouldn't, right? But a good father would never do that. And Jesus says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's a little bit of a weird application if you're tracking along. You're like, all right, Jesus, I need a car. Give me a car. I need a house. Give me a house. I need a wife. Give me a wife. But then you said, give me the Holy Spirit. See, that's because we are so easily tempted in this life to confuse wants with needs. And there is no need you have greater than God himself. That's what Jesus is trying to drive to. What is the Holy Spirit? Well, this would take me hours to unpack and I don't have time right now. I have another series. We will in this series, keep coming. But the Holy Spirit is God in you. See, on the day of Pentecost, in the book of Acts, there are all these Hebrew people who are hearing that Jesus died for their sins. That Jesus wants a relationship with them. He's now King and Lord. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. And they stand up and say, well, what do we do? And the response from Peter and the other apostles on Pentecost is, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What we're doing in baptism is we're surrendering our bodies and inviting God and saying, I need you. I need you to change me. I need you to transform me. I need you. It's a plea for holiness. It's a plea for the Holy Spirit. I want you to imagine a coin because both sides of the coin are the coin, right? Which of the coin, which side? Is it the head side or the tail side that's the coin? And the answer is both. They're two sides of the same coin. So imagine a coin. On one side, what you have is you have a group of people who are so marred by sin, that's us, that we needed saved. 
So Jesus came, died on the cross, rose from the dead to take away our sin. What happened in that moment is God made us holy. He transformed us. He changed us. He made us holy. Now, on the other side, God calls us to be holy. And the only way we're going to live out that call to be holy is the power of God inside us transforming us. That's the Holy Spirit. So above everything else that you need, everything else that you ask him for, you need the Holy Spirit to partner with you in bringing his kingdom of heaven to earth so that you can get done everything God's calling you to get done, his will and his ways in a way that's holy. And you don't start doing business the same way. You don't start treating your spouse the same way. You don't start treating your kids the same way. The world becomes transformed by the people of God living out the ways of God, even when it's hard. And you need the Holy Spirit to do that. So what would it look like for the next three weeks for you to draw into the presence of your father and say, help? Go to the Bible Project. They're doing a series on the Sermon on the Mount right now. You can find it on YouTube. They just released a video, and it's so beautiful. If you take Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, I thought I'd turn that off. Oh, everybody else, that wasn't me. Good job. <laughs> Let me use my illustration a second. Let's pray, ready? Father, as we kick off these next three weeks, uh, holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, whatever we need. And God, forgive us of all our sins. Give us the power and the courage to forgive others, even the people we really don't want to. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me finish what I was saying. Bible Project guys made a video, and they showed how these three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount, the exact center is that phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's not an accident. This whole prayer, this whole our father is about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. This whole prayer, it's about God, here's what I need. Would you do it through me? Would you do it in me? Would you change me, transform me so that I might be holy like Jesus here in this world? I love the way Brennan Manning says this. If you took the love of all the best mothers and fathers who have lived in the course of human history, all their goodness, kindness, patience, fidelity, wisdom, tenderness, strength, and love, and united all those qualities into one single person, that person's love would only be a faint shadow of the furious love and mercy in the heart of God, the Father addressed to you and me at this the best of the best of the world all smashed together would barely scratch the surface of the awesome love of God. What we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna sing a song that'll be new to you, but it won't be new to you. It's just the words of the Our Father. So you might not know the exact tone or where it's going next or when it goes up or when it goes down, but I wanna challenge you that as you feel prompted to give it a try and jump in and sing it with us. Go ahead and stand and I'll pray and ask God to move in this place. <laughs> My God and Father, would you, would you bring about something right here in this place as we sing the words of this prayer back to you? God, I pray for people in this room right now, they have a real need, a legit need, something in their heart and life and mind they're afraid of, they don't know how to fix it, they don't know where it's going, they don't know what to do. And God, would you meet them in that place, in that place of need to provide their daily bread? God, there's some people in this room and they're, they're carrying around the weight of sin or something else that's hindering them and keeping them back from you. And I pray right now, God, that they would draw into your presence right now through this song, that they would hear from heaven and hear from you. Father, I pray that they would uh, release it to you, turn from their sin, 
or give to you the weight that's bogging them down. Father, I pray for our enemies today, those who've hurt us the most that we've been holding a grudge and bitterness against for a really long time. God, over these next three weeks, would you bring about a healing that can only be explained by the power of your Holy Spirit, that gift given to us inside us. And we ask you, Father, above all else, to keep us from the evil one, that we might walk with you and be holy all the days of our life. In Jesus' name.